Welcome. The last story that we encountered was about the Sabbath, the Shabbat, that important day to the Jewish calendar. It's a holiday every week. It's a holy day. And basically, um, in chapter 3, we're starting Mark chapter 3, another story about the Sabbath here. And for those who you might not know, especially you young ones, just in case, uh, uh, they, you know, there's seven days in a week. The first day to the Jewish calendar is Sunday. And then the second day is Monday, Tuesday, then on up until Saturday is the seventh day, the day of rest. It's the Sabbath day. It ends, it begins at about sundown of uh, Friday night, 6-ish, 6.30, whatever. And it goes to sundown as Saturday night. So it's Friday night to Saturday is the Sabbath, okay? And that is to this day what it is. And by the way, the Bible never did change that day exactly. Um, in the New Testament, um, they still remained, the Sabbath was still on a Saturday. Of course, the Christians started uh, worshiping and coming together on the first day of the week. The Bible does mention that. But anyway, real quick, the purpose of the Sabbath was a creation rest, uh, to take a day of rest like God took a day of rest. God didn't need a day of rest. We do. <laughs> we need some time down. Creation rest. And then we also had the holy uh, it's a holy day for the uh, Jewish people, and it was the it's it's kind of the Jewish covenantal sign. It's a covenant sign. It would distinguish in, it distinguished this people group, Jewish people, from the other nations. They had the seventh day where they uh, rested and they took a day off, and that was the time where they are not to go out and work, and they're to you know worship and rest and 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 uh, think about God and all. The next one mentioned that I would have to say it was actually became a de definite commandment, a law to keep. Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Six days you shall work and on the seventh day you shall rest. This is uh, the fourth commandment of the Ten Commandments. Okay. So with that in mind, um, Jesus is again challenged on the Sabbath. Here's what the uh, Bible says in chapter 3, verse 1. It says, another, another time he went in the synagogue. By the, by the way, I made a, a slight mistake in the last video, and I like to always correct my mistakes when I see it. Matthew didn't say it was the next Saturday that this happened, this next Sabbath. Actually, it seems like it was a combination of the grain fields that he was eating in, uh, that they were eating in, and then, the, and then as he was on his way to the uh, Sabbath uh, synagogue, which could be actually this day. Luke kind of mentions it as another occasion, another time. But anyway, it says, another time he went into the synagogue, uh, the Jewish gathering, the Jewish church, uh, and a man with a withered hand was, was present. So withered means, actually it means to dry up. It, it dried all up. So he had no life in it, all the way probably up his arm. Uh, it was kind of paralyzed, and it seems like it's indicating in the uh, in the deeper reading of it that it was not by birth. It could have been, but it could have been some uh, accident or disease that caused this to happen. So, you know, he had this for whoever knows how long. He had this uh, situation where his hand, he couldn't move. It was withered. It was all twisted up, and he couldn't move it. Okay, um, and it says some of them, who are the them? <laughs> Pharisees, because after the passage, like in chapter, verse 6 or verse 7, uh, it says, um, in verse 6, it talks about the Pharisees went out, so it was them. Now, I think it's pretty de definite that they deliberately were there to catch Jesus and try and see if he was going to heal him, because that's what it says. They actually planned on, plotted on to see if he was going to heal him on the Sabbath, which is a good thing, but they wanted to get him with the idea of working on the Sabbath. <laughs> so it says, uh, some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. They were trying to find something. They were like spying on him again, trying to catch him in any error of what he's going to say or what he's going to do. And so they uh, watched him closely, like a, I have a hawk. They were like just watching him really carefully as if he was a criminal, see? You know, you write, you, you know, like a warden of a jail watches uh, criminals or something to see how they're acting in the, uh, in the place. Watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. And they knew he was going to. It, it was a plot. It was a plan. They schemed it. Maybe even they brought this guy in there. I don't know. Jesus said to the man, instead of like waiting, because he could have waited and healed him. And yes, he did heal him, which is so cool. 
He healed this guy from this paralysis. It's so amazing. What a savior. Try not to go over these stories and say, oh, he healed him. Let's go on. Now, think about that. This guy couldn't move, and suddenly it was restored like the other one. At least some of the manuscripts say that. It was Matthew definitely said in Matthew 12, it was restored like the other one. So it wasn't like he couldn't clap. He couldn't move it. He, and by the way, Luke mentions that it's his right hand. So we know which hand it even was, which is the main hand that most people have. Some people are left-handed. Uh, but, you know, he was probably a worker or something. By the way, there's a, uh, a story outside of the Bible, a, 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 a tradition and another writing um, from way back that mentions that this guy actually asked Jesus to heal him. I don't, I don't know about all that. Could have. He was a mason, he said, like he was, he was a hard worker, a stone worker or something. Anyway, so whatever. The guy was, uh, he, he, was he had a shriveled hand. <laughs> it was dried up. Uh, then uh, Jesus said, stand up in front of everyone. He said, rise up and get up in center stage. Come in front of everyone. Which there's so much here you could think about. Like, what was that like for him? Pretty embarrassing. He's being put on the spot. And it's like already when you have a deformity, and most people think in those days it was cursed by God and all that, that, you know, he's, he's actually putting him in an awkward position. He could have said, no, I'm not going to do that and left and not been healed. So he obeyed Jesus. This is a lesson for you, lesson for me. Obey Jesus and everything that he ever tells you to do. Just do it. And don't think twice about it. Don't wonder about it. Think about the outcome. Think about the circumstances. If God tells you to do something, do it right away. When you know you're supposed to do it right away, he did. He went right up in the center, center stage in front of everybody. Everybody's eyes were on him. Of course, the Pharisees were still looking at Jesus. You know, they were staring at him. But this guy has probably a pretty awkward moment. And Jesus does want to stretch us into awkward moments here. Speaking of stretching, this is what he said in a little bit, what he did for him to do. But he put him in an awkward situation. He puts me in awkward situations where I'm supposed to confront someone. I'm supposed to say something. I'm supposed to do something that's pretty, pretty like, wow, I'm going to have to trust God. Exactly. This guy must have trusted Jesus because he went right up there in front. Then Jesus asked them. He, he went right to them. And they were trying to do a sneaky thing here to try and catch him. So he put them right out in the spotlight and brought their hearts right out in the spotlight. He just came right at them and he, he, he confronted them. That's what he asked. What a great question. He says, is it is it, how's he say it? He says, uh, which is lawful on the Sabbath to do? Which is legal? Lawful. That, they were all about the law. So he dealt with it right there. He went right into it, right into the heart of it. He said, well, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil? Well, you know, what's the answer to that? Of course, to do good, right? Which is lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil? And then he goes beyond that and he even says to save life or to kill. What are the answers? Good and life. That reminds me of Deuteronomy, by the way. It even talks about the law, the climax of the law, the heart of the law is uh, to, do, to, have, to give life, life from the law. And good and life, choose life or choose death, or choose blessing, or choose cursing. That whole law is wrapped up into that. So Jesus is actually using terms from Deuteronomy, which is pretty cool. And then it says this, but they remain silent. They just stubbornly got quiet. Oh. <laughs> they knew the answer is to do good. If they would have said to do good, then he would have healed him and no problems. But they, they were trapped. He trapped them with his words and he brought out their hearts to show what their hearts were really like. They're so interested in keeping the Sabbath that they decided to, um, you know, put him in there so that he could heal the guy on the Sabbath and he could have been healed the next day. Jesus could have waited, by the way. He could have waited till he was private, did it privately. But he's trying to confront their hearts because he loves them as well. And when Jesus tells us stuff that's tough on our lives, it's because he loves us. He cares. He cares about those people. He also wanted his disciples to hear it. He also wanted everybody else in the synagogue to hear it. What a, sh what a show. What a, not a show performance thing, but what a, what a situation, a scenario. See, the devil was behind it trying to trap him. Can't trap Jesus. <laughs> he trapped them. But they remained silent. Now, what was Jesus' reaction to this? I love this. It says, but he looked at them in anger. 
Jesus got angry. And he's, th this is a wrong, one strong place in the gospel where it says he was angry. Although he was indignant at another place when they were in Matthew 12, I mean 19, it says that uh, Jesus, they brought, uh, the disciples said, hey, don't let the children come close. And he says, let the children come close. He was not happy with that. He was, he, he turned the, the uh, tables over, if you remember, in the temple, and I think he was angry at that. He was probably angry in his discourse in Matthew 23 with the seven different things he came against, the Pharisees and scribes with hypocrites, blind guides, serpents, and all that. Probably anger was in his voice there, but it's all because of love. God gets angry. Anger is not a bad emotion. It's a very healthy emotion, as long as it's not self-centered and angry about what they're doing to me and all that. But it's a, what the Bible call it, well, the Bible doesn't call it righteous anger. God is angry a lot. It's mentioned in the Old Testament, even in the New, how his anger is raised up in the book of Revelation and, you know, the wrath of God abides on people, it says in the book of John, etc. Yeah. So wrath is good. Anger is good. The Bible says, be angry, but don't sin in your anger. But anyway, he looked around about them in anger. By the way, in that place right there, it's actually a quick anger. The Greek of that is just a flash just quickly got anger. He didn't stay angry. It says, he looked around, around about them in angry and deeply distressed, grieved, deeply in pain. And he, his tender heart had a mix of feelings there, a mixture, which I love. God has a mixture of emotion. And, uh, and that is that he, he looked at him with, with, and by the way, this one, when it says grieve, being grieved at him, he, that lasted. It wasn't just a quick grief. He, he was, had a deep compassion for these people that were so stubborn and hard-headed and hard-hearted and evil. They were mean. They didn't care about that guy at all. They're trying to trap Jesus in some way. And so he looked at about, about them in anger and deep distre deeply distressed at their hardened hearts, stubborn, rock hard, like this. Like it was like a rock. Their hearts weren't soft and pliable and, and, and sensitive and, and tender. You don't want to have a hard, rocky heart. If they would have uh, let, the, let the question kind of seep into their minds and their hearts and they'd say, you know, it is, it's okay to do good on the Sabbath. Uh, Matthew mentions the idea of a sheep. Like if, you, if one of your sheep falls into a ditch, wouldn't you help them? You know, of course they would. They wouldn't let that sheep just stay there. Um, but anyway, uh, he looked at them uh, uh, around him with anger and deeply distress, and he said to the man, then he pointed to the man, and he said this, not pointed to the man, he looked at the man, and he said, stretch forth your hand. I love that. Now, this guy can't do that. He's going to do an impossible thing. And so the guy could have said, that's embarrassing. I can't do it, and ran out. But he went ahead and did whatever he could. He didn't feel any muscle or anything, but he attempted to feel muscle. He imagined it. He, he went ahead and went, okay, I'm going to stretch forth. And as he stretched forth, the power of God, the power of the Holy Spirit came on his hand, and he got healed. He stretched forth his hand, which he couldn't have been able to do. But the power of God can do all the impossible. If you obey God and you go by faith, your, your life will be blessed, and he will give you some miracles in your life, too happens it's happened with me for sure stretched forth your hand and he stretched a hand he stretched it out his hand and his his hand was completely restored beautiful then it says then the pharisees went out and began to plot with the herodians whatever that is we'll explain that best i can how they might kill jesus at this point it was a turning point this was like the last straw that broke the camel's back type thing. They were so mad at him that they decided we got to plot his destruction. And that began the process of them coming to a point where they wanted to kill him. That, that's when they started doing it. It's just too many story after stories about Jesus uh, that really got him mad. Now, a couple things to think about here. I want to mention this Sabbath work idea. What was the Sabbath work about this? Well, there's all sorts of the laws they came up with outside of the Bible. It's called oral tradition, oral meaning word tradition that was later written down. But the Sabbath, quote unquote, work, some of the work was this. Some of it was good. I mean, you know, some of it you're supposed to work. A woman in childbirth might be helped. You're allowed to do that. <clears throat> you know, baby's about to be given birth. Yeah, but it's okay to help her. Of course. 
<laughs> but they even have wrote it down like that's a law. That's it's okay to help the child in, in birth. You know, this is some of the Pharisees' rules and laws. A throat infection, like you have a sore throat of some sort, might be treated. You might be able to help the throat infection. If someone needs medicine, give it to him. If someone needs a hand stretched forth, give it to him while Jesus is in town. We don't know where he was, by the way. It's possible and strong possibility he was back in Capernaum, but who knows? Could have been one of the other synagogues. But a throat infection might be treated is what they said. These are some of the laws, some of the many, many rules. Uh, if a wall fell on anyone, like someone you know was walking along, a, a wall fell on him, clear enough to see if he's alive. Check it if he's, if he's alive. If so, he might be helped. You might be able to help him. If he's dead, leave, it, leave his body there till the next day. That is a rule. That is a law that they said. Now, they believe, by the way, that if a person is in a life situation, a life-threatening situation, that, yes, it's okay to break the law of the Sabbath and go ahead and help that person. But they didn't think this guy had a life-threatening situation, and he didn't. But Jesus still healed him. See, it's okay to do good. And by the way, remember he mentioned, or was, is it better to uh, keep alive, to help some live or die? And they actually plotted his death right on that Sabbath. They were breaking the law. Now, who was breaking the Sabbath more? Jesus healing by someone or then plotting his death that very day? All right. So anyway, a fracture could not be helped. If you break your arm, leave it. Sorry, can't help you. You can't help set a broken arm or something or a broken leg. Just leave it be in pain. That's, that's a rule that they said. I can't help that. That's work. <laughs> Another one is don't put cold water. water. Cold water could not be poured on a, a sprained hand or a foot or something. Don't pour water on him. Don't help him. A cut finger. Eh, you can put a plain bandage, but you can't have ointment on it. See, all these meticulous rule after rule thing there's so many of them and uh that's that's the point you know it's like oh my goodness jesus wants to heal people jesus wants to give life and a, a sabbath is a beautiful day to come to church and to get healed i've been healed like on different days with sabbath if i've been healed on the sabbath i think so probably uh yeah so it's wonderful stuff here um so the just a couple more items here uh i i there's a collection here um, that I think there were seven times that Jesus literally healed on the Sabbath over and over, at least the recorded times. There could have been a lot more. <clears throat> seven recorded healings on Sabbath. The demonized guy, remember, in Capernaum. Uh, the Peter's mother-in-law was healed on that day, on the Sabbath. She had a fever, if you remember. The crippled man in Jerusalem, that's in John chapter 5. Great story we'll get to later. Crippled man in Jerusalem, he healed him right on that Sabbath. And boy, did that cause a fury and, a, and, a, and an anger in the Pharisees and all. A man with a withered hand, which is this story that we just described. That's also mentioned in Matthew and Luke. Woman bowed together. Seven, 18 years of this guy, of this woman was bowed over like this and he delivered her from that spirit of infirmity. A woman bowed together was healed on the Sabbath. The man with dropsy, he healed this guy from that. A man born blind, that's in John chapter 9. A, more, a man born blind was healed on the Sabbath. <laughs> so there's seven of them that, that he just kept doing it. He didn't, it didn't let him uh, stop him at all of the disagreement that the religious people had against him. And then one other thing I would like to mention, I think, to end, and uh, who are these Herodians? Well, first of all, I would like to say there were different s sects, different groups, um, sect here, Jewish sects, right here, sections of people, groups of people. The main ones were Pharisees, Sadducees, Essenes, and Zealots. Those three, and then the fourth one. So Pharisees, we've talked about Sadducees, we've talked about Essenes are not mentioned in the Bible, but they're definitely a, a group in that time near the Dead Sea. The Zealots, like Simon the Zealot was one of the apostles, you know, and these were a revolutionary group that were more militant and they wanted to fight Rome instead of opposing. All these opposed Rome, they kind of came into agreement with them pretty much. Pharisees did not like Romans, which is really interesting here. They didn't like the Herods, the Herodian uh, dynasty 
uh, the Pharisees were the people that, you know, mainly opposed Jesus, a lot of them. And so, and then also there, uh, uh, Josephus mentions a group called the Fourth Philosophy, which could have been one of these others. There are some that believe that the, the Fourth Philosophy and the Sakari were the same. This was sort of a zealot type group. The Sakari was actually a, a knife, a dagger, a twisted dagger that was used to uh, kill the enemies of, of God, the Romans, the Sakari. And then there's this group, and I don't know if I should put them in parentheses. There may not be an actual sect per se. They just were sort of a different group that were persuaded that the Herods were pretty good. I mean, at least they seem to be coming in, in agreement with them. Now, what's so fascinating about them is that they and the Pharisees did not like each other. The Pharisees did not like the Her Herodians because the Herodians were probably younger Jewish people who, like adult, young adults, who probably dressed like Gentiles and Greeks, and they kind of were uh, uh, approving of Herod the Great, Herod Antipas, Herod Philip, different Herods in that time. The sons and the, and the grandfather and the father of, uh, of Herod Antipas. And so they seemed to be in agreement with them and they liked that they were in league with them. They were, they were approving of the Herods, which the Pharisees did not. And yet, in the end of this, this verse right here, in the end of this passage, it says that they plotted with the Herodians. The Pharisees and the Herodians were enemies, natural enemies came together that kind of mark is trying to show you that kind of shows you how hateful the pharisees were against jesus to actually come in league with a common ground because herod's group may be political in the religious group the the um pharisees came together political and religious group possibly th that came together to plot and trying to figure out how they can destroy jesus how they can kill him it's pretty significant. That's why it's mentioned here. And their Herodians are mentioned. That word is mentioned three times in the, in the Bible. And uh, they're not hardly mentioned anywhere outside of the Bible. Josephus doesn't even mention them as Herodians. He mentions uh, uh, that Josephus, by the way, if you can't remember, this was a Jewish historian. He mentioned that these guys were uh, patrons or let's see, how does it say it? They were um, partisan to Herod. And they could have been the group he's talking about, not even sure. So they may not be a group or a sect per se, uh, but I put them in there because they were certainly a sort of a group of people that seemed to like the Herods and agreed with them. And uh, Pharisees came into league, even with their enemies, to come against the enemy, Jesus. And so anyway, there you go. There's quite a story there. And there's a lot to be learned yet. If we continue talking, we could get, you know, bring out all sorts of other things. Um, I love how Jesus took uh, the, the law of God and he, he says the law of God really is in this on behalf of the people of God. And it's, it's for our good. And it's in the spirit of the law, not the letter, the legal, meticulous, every single point, you know, like of and all these extra things to keep you from breaking the law. They had all these extra, extra rules that God didn't set up at all. And he, he didn't like it. And because of that, the hardening of the hearts of the Pharisees, uh, thinking that they were the religious holy people there were actually became unholy because they were, they didn't even care about that guy who had the withered hand. They're just trying to plot against Jesus. They weren't even thinking about, wow, Jesus is going to heal this guy. What a wonderful thing. They didn't think that at all. And so you have to be careful, even as a Christian, that your heart doesn't harden. Let's say certain people come into the church or some people like whatever, that you don't like who they are, what they are, what they're like and all that. We should love people. And that's what Jesus did. And he actually healed this guy right on the Sabbath deliberately in your face. And uh, that's him trying to reach them and challenge them in their beliefs. All right. God bless you. Thanks for listening.